Hi, welcome to Beer and Business. I'm Tom Ellsworth with the BizDoc, and we're here with Phil Condit, the retired CEO of Boeing. Phil, it is great to have you here today. It's wonderful so to be here. what are you having, first of all? Uh, that's an IPA. Wonderful, and I think that's from the Community Beer Company here in Dallas, Texas, and this is their Wit Beer, also from the Community Beer Company. Well, great to have you. You know, as the CEO of Boeing, you know, there's a lot that's written about leadership and there's a lot of written about management, but what are the couple core points of leadership that you honed over the years that you found to be really effective? I think the real key is it is really about people. You know, it's not about tools, it's not about numbers, it's about people. And how do you inspire people to do great things? So for example, on the 777 program, we had a, a motto, a, a mission statement. It was people working together to produce the preferred new airplane family. And I used to make this speech over and over. It starts with people. Did you have mentors early in your career that kind of drew these things out of you? Or did you just through experience say, you know what, this is the way to do it and this is why I'm gonna drive it? I had some great mentors and they really fall in two categories. The ones that thoughtfully helped, guided, taught you and the ones that you said, I want to learn not to ever do that. <laughs> you know, they, you, you learn from both of them, but the one that comes to mind immediately was uh, a professor at university who was my advisor. Uh, and just a quick story, uh, two stories maybe. The first was he taught a class in which he just told stories, stories about how things got done, and his stories were great. I learned an incredible amount, I can still remember those stories. The second was he called me into his office. Uh, I had finished my master's degree, was starting to work on my PhD, and he said, you need to get out of here. Completely taken aback, he said, what do you mean? You don't think I'm doing okay? He said, no, you're doing fine. You're doing great. He said, you need to go make things. I said, where, where do you think I ought to go? He said, I think you ought to go to Boeing. And that's a true story. You know, you mentioned the thing about where you look at some leaders or some manager you have and you say, you know what, I'm not going to do it that way. And it kind of speaks to mistakes. Mistakes are going to happen. If you never make mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. Well, how did you handle mistakes? For instance, is there a mistake that happened early in your career that you didn't handle it well? And how did you recover from it? And there may be a mistake that happened early in your career that you handled it well and you say, boy, I'm so glad I did that. You know, it, it's hard to, for me to put my finger on individual events, but I know I learned an incredible amount of mistake that I made early on. Uh, I had just been made a supervisor. I had been trained as an engineer. I would spent my early career as an engineer, and I had been given a job as a supervisor in marketing, and I didn't know anything at all about marketing. And I sort of tried to fake it a little bit. And one of the guys in the group came up and said, you don't have to do that. And I realized leadership wasn't about knowing all of the answers. It was about leading. They knew more about the answers than I would ever know. I needed to lead. Uh, and that was a great learning experience. Could you um, think back to maybe a project or something that was going to, as we say, be on the rocks. Something's not going to happen. And it happens today. You don't have to be building an airplane. You could be a young entrepreneur in, in the Ukraine. Uh, with a group of people and the first rev of the software just isn't doing what it's supposed to do. How do you rally people back when there's still enough time on the clock? In other words, we haven't missed a customer delivery, we haven't missed a commitment, so we're not completely screwed, but we've got some time to recover. How do you, you lead and pull people up from maybe where they've had a, um, just a suboptimal output and now you got to rally them back to say, hey, there's still time on the clock and we can pull this out of the ditch, let's go do it. I think the real key is continuity of thought, that you set the culture early that says we're going to work together. We're going to accomplish things together. You communicate as you go along so that it isn't we're doing great, we're doing great, we're doing great, oops, we fell in a hole. It is we all know where we are, we know what the challenges are, and we're committed to doing them together. Again, referring back to the 777 program, one of the adages in the program was no secrets because you can't work on a secret. And human beings, if it's not going well, want to work harder. And what we were trying to do is encourage people to say, I've got a problem, can I have some help? It made an enormous difference. 
talk a little bit more about that secret. You just touched on something, no secrets, because people get fearful that they've made an error and that becomes a secret and they're trying to work their way out of it. You know, how do you encourage people to say, hey, hey hang on, you know, I'm, no one's gonna get decapitated here, right? Uh, you know, the, the French Revolution is long ago. Well, that's not the way we do things. How do you counsel and give people the confidence to raise the hand and say, oops, or maybe more than oops? Again, I think it's, it's part of culture, and culture in an organization is absolutely vital. If the culture is, if you're caught making a mistake, we're gonna shoot you. People aren't gonna expose those problems. They're gonna try to solve them all by themselves, and they may get worse and worse and worse, and then finally explode. Instead, if you say, hey, we are in this together. This is a team. We are working together. We need to know where our challenges are. The only way we can do that is if you'll tell us when you have a problem, and it works. I think every generation, every era has some, there's a technological advantage that's coming up that's just helping us do more things, whether it's the desktop computer or now big cloud-based data systems. What did you see that you wished you could have shared with you know, the students or the people hiring the fresh people? It says, look for this and look for that and encourage people to have these skills because this is a new skill they're gonna need because the ocean isn't the same as when I set sail. It's different. And you new sailors are gonna need some new things. What were some of those things you look back that you say, wow, you new folks, it's not the same as it was. You need to have this. I think maybe the most important message is that there will continue to be change. So what may be applicable today will not be tomorrow or the next day. I look back over my career. The first computer we used was absolutely huge. You fed it with punch cards. Um, if you dropped your deck of punch cards, you were in deep trouble because they got mixed up and you had to start all over again. There's more power in my laptop today than that computer that filled whole rooms. Just that kind of change. I would suggest is that people need to be able to think critically so that when the data appears, when the charts appear, when the PowerPoint pitch is there, you can ask the question, does that make sense? Is that reasonable? Just saying to me, but that's what the computer said, isn't the right answer. Is that not? How, how do I answer the question, is that reasonable? That's a great, great skill and it lasts. Most people want to get something done, which is reach a conclusion, okay, I'm done. How do you get execution and adaptability for change. How do you mentor that to so that they're they're unafraid to come to you and say, you know what, I was asking myself, is this reasonable? And frankly, boss, I think we have to turn a bit. Right. As a leader, I think the key is openness. That that you present a picture that says, I want you to come and ask those kind of questions. I want you to challenge me. And at the same time then I can do the same with you. Where are we headed? Where do we need to be going? How are we going to incorporate the capabilities that are coming along? Uh, what can we do with robotics? How will that affect our, our lives? So that the culture of the organization has built into it the fact that there will be change. And therefore, it's part of the expected result. It's, it's there, it will be there, it will continue to be there. Change also goes over to competition because the way that companies engage and sold product today is so much different from 10 years from now and 10 years ago. And you face some things, if it's okay to talk about, because there's a little bit of an unfair advantage because Airbus was sponsored by governments. You were not sponsored by governments. You were taxed by one very large government <laughs> and a regulation from one very large government. How did you handle what you felt was something unfair? Because maybe some you know, young men and women are building a company that's going to compete with Google on ad sales online, or it's going to compete with like the, uh, the coterie of people that have put together Instacart that's delivering groceries in two hours, now find themselves competing against Amazon who bought Whole Foods. And sometimes they sit back and say, well, that's not fair. You know, it's not fair. How did you, in a world that really wasn't fair because you had a semi-monopoly sponsored by governments with Airbus selling a wonderful airplane against you, you know, independently here in the United States, how did you defeat the defeatist notion of when things weren't fair? So there's two parts to that. 
The first one is there are always senses of things that are not fair. And I used to use the illustration. I said, if, if we challenged Europe to a football game, the United States team would appear with shoulder pads and a funny shaped ball and a set of rules that said you have four tries to advance at 10 yards, you can throw it, you can catch it. The European team would show up with a round ball and short pants and jerseys, and you can't touch the ball with your hands unless you're the goalie. And they would say, our rules are wrong. We would say their rules are wrong. I thought you said football. <laughs> I thought you said football. <laughs> so that reality always exists. There will be differences. The other guy has an advantage you don't have. You have an advantage they don't have. The important thing then is to find out where your advantage lies and use it effectively. Because Airbus has government sponsorship, they tend to be much slower. Governments don't move at a high pace. So if you're gonna compete, move quickly, move decisively. If you spend a lot of time wandering around complaining about the fact the world's not fair, the world's not fair. Look for how best do you compete, where are your advantages, how do you take advantage of those things? One of the techniques that you use, you said, you know what, they're government sponsored and they're not gonna move as fast. But you are a huge, huge organization. You think of all that it takes to make an airplane, um, just somebody like me from the outside, and you're like, wow, this is overwhelming. How did you get a project at building a plane? Because, you know, I've read that things were faster from the design, from implementation, when you left than when you got there that it was a faster, more nimble Boeing when it came to designing and building the next aircraft, like this 777, or the iterations of a wonderful workhorse aircraft, the 737, that everybody here in Dallas knows a 737 because Southwest is down the street, and apparently they own all the 737s. <laughs> it seems like it. A lot it. of them. But it was a whole different Boeing when you left. It was much faster, more nimble, and people talk about that. What did you do to help, you know, create you know, a culture of speed in addition to the other cultures, elements like of people and things that you had put in place? It's a, it's a real challenge. How do you get a large number of people moving more quickly? A lot of it can be done organizationally. How do you create small organizations that are more nimble, that can look for opportunities and then build on those opportunities? You create an entrepreneurial spirit inside parts of the organization to be creative and then find ways of getting those creations into your into your products. A lot of it goes back to just communication. How do you how do you talk all of the time so that that people begin to, to really appreciate why you're doing these things. The reality is if you don't communicate, people will answer it for themselves and they may get the wrong answer. So you're far better off to tell them why you're doing it, what you're trying to accomplish, what your goals are. You know what's I think really interesting is there are certain principles that we have to learn over time, like hiring people, managing people, and then sometimes having to say goodbye to people in organizations that aren't performing. And those skills take time to learn. But there's some things that boy, if they just told me a couple of these things when I walked out of you know, the university or when I stepped into my first job, if someone had just given me a couple of these tips, boy, I could have used those on day one. What are a couple tips that maybe you wish that you knew on day one when you had that professor say, you know, Phil, you need to be out of here, just go build something. I think maybe the most important would be the world is far from perfect. Organizations are far from perfect. I've watched a lot of people struggle thinking that the boss ought to be perfect, their job ought to be perfect, and it isn't. And so if you go in with an attitude that says, I know it's not gonna be perfect, but I'm gonna do my part to make it better. It has a powerful effect on your own career and on those of the people around you. How would you counsel a person coming out uh, a university today who maybe is an engineering expert, um, how would you counsel them to be self-reflective, to find those things to say, okay, I can figure this out and figure it out. I'm gonna figure it out by getting advice from a mentor or I'm gonna read a book independently or things. How do you counsel somebody to say, you know, you're a really sharp engineer, you're really good. 
here's how to be self-reflective and honest with yourself. I think the words you use are, are really important, the self-reflective piece. I think that's absolutely crucial. A lot of people think that mentors are steps on their career progress, that the reason I'm seeking a mentor is someone to pull me up as opposed to someone to teach me. Those are two very different things. Got it. And one I'm is a watched. transaction to get promoted. Another one is to accept the fact that you're just learning. Yeah, and you will always be learning. One of the things I value very deeply is a learning organization. People in it who know they will always be learning. Not, I'm going to learn for five years and be done, but I will always be learning. And that attitude that says there's more I can learn every day, I think is crucial. When you, when you left Boeing, were there skills that the company had that you helped build over those years that weren't there before that you say, you know what, this is now an advantage and it wasn't an advantage previously, but now, wow, this is, we've really built an advantage out of it. That maybe, you know, the analysts don't necessarily see from the market, you don't see it in the stock ticker, but when you looked over your shoulder and say, wow, here's a perfect example of how we built something that when I left, I'm saying, wow, that's an advantage now. I think the, the one that jumps to mind is actually organizational. One of the challenges that we had was you take a great engineer and if they wanted to advance to a position where they could get stock options, things like that, there was only one path and that was into management. And very frequently you took a really good engineer and made a lousy manager. Oh. That's a bad trade. What we did was set up a fellowship and you could become a, an associate fellow, a fellow, or a senior fellow. And those carried with them the same kind of compensation that a senior manager would get. So you could make a conscious choice. I want to stay in a technical career path. I want to become a senior fellow where my technical expertise can be used across the company. And I can be respected for what I have done as opposed to going into a a leadership position. Giving people multiple paths that they can follow that are rewarding, I think is, a, is something we left with that company that has made a huge difference. You've touched on something really strong because the classic thing is, I'm the best engineer here and I want to be the director of engineer, damn it. And it's like, wait a minute, you're a phenomenal engineer. Don't keep me down. Wait, I'm going to pay you more and I'm going to put you on this path. And you may become at some point in the future, the director of engineering. But right now, you are gonna be a respected person that I'm gonna put on this fellowship line and it's gonna get you the compensation you want. It's gonna get you this. Now, your delivery, you have to keep giving us this intellectual delivery and give us your genius. And you have to give us your genius in a way that all these teams can use it. That's what makes you valuable. That's why I just gave you the stock options. But what you just said, Phil, um, I'm going to get emails about this, and I know, because people are going to see that and say, wow, I have that exact thing. I don't want to make this person the manager of engineering because I know it's going to happen. Uh, and I, I think you've really given some people a golden nugget there. So one of the challenges, we frequently take the best engineer and say, well, we'll make them the head of that group. The problem is the group knows they were the best engineer, and that person tries to do what they were good at, which is the engineering telling the other people how to do the job. That is not the job of a leader. The job of the leader is to help them be capable of doing the job themselves. What did you do at Boeing to create, you know, entrepreneurial spirit among small groups where you said, hey guys, this particular thing that doesn't exist, we gotta go make it. And I'm gonna build an entrepreneurial spirit here in what some people call this large corporate enterprise and we pulled it off. We, we did a number of things. I mean, small organizations, some of them that are, that are there, Phantom Works, the equivalent of Skunk Works, doing really quick prototyping kind of things, investing in startups, just so you can get the, the knowledge and find out what's going on, setting little groups up and giving them a, a challenge. Sometimes those work, sometimes they don't work, just like all startups. But you, you want to do that in any organization. You want to create an entrepreneurial spirit inside. We had something called the Chairman's Initiative, which was come up with ideas and we'll recognize great ideas. So you actually invested in startups? Yes. Are there any examples you can talk about? Um, well, you can go look. Today, the, the uh, 
Boeing has invested in an electric airplane company. They've in, invested in, actually acquired a company called Aurora Flight Sciences. Uh, just, there's a lot of those little kind of investments, battery technology. You're, you're just looking for the future. You know, one of the great challenges of a company like Boeing is I will get credit for things that my predecessors did or blame for things my predecessors did. <laughs> and my successors will get credit for or blame for things I did. It isn't like Wall Street frequently thinks, the CEO, whoever's the CEO right now, whoosh, gets all the credit or all, the, all of the blame. Um, these things are go on over a long period of time and seeds you planted a long time ago may mature um, or may not. What skills did you personally bring when you, when you came in? that you then, I suppose, would mentor and, you know, kind of communicate to the others around you or set some standards around? You know, it's, it's really an interesting question. Um, I was trained as an engineer, four years of undergraduate engineering, two years of graduate engineering. My first two years at Boeing were in engineering. The skill that probably was most important was people. Understanding people, what motivated them, what excited them, how to get an organization to do amazing things. Uh, one of the great mentors along the way was Herb Kelleher at Southwest Airlines. Uh, a Dallas hero. Yeah, a, a master of people. I mean, he was trained as a lawyer, but what was his great skill? His great skill was people. Leadership is a very, very complex thing. I'm fascinated by it. It's situational. Sometimes you've got to be almost dictatorial because time is crucial. We've got to do it. We've got to do it now. And times it needs to be very inclusive. There are wonderful little techniques in the way you talk to people so that they are in the game and ready to go. It's an exciting, exciting challenge. What do you think about all the texting and social media that builds us quick communication lines um, but it's not direct face-to-face. -face. Do you think this is helpful, or would you encourage people to, you know, really pressure themselves for the face-to-face? -face? The tools can be helpful, but they are tools. Face-to-face -to -face is the most powerful communication tool. There is so much else going on. If I sit down with a group of people and talk to them, that is so different than getting on FaceTime or Skype. Now, if you have an organization that has worked together a lot, people know each other, and you are conducting, for example, a business review, those tools are very powerful. I don't have to have everybody in the same room. We're looking at data, where is it going? What do we have? What Are we on schedule? Are we not on schedule? But when you're dealing with how do we do something new, how do we think about something new face-to-face -face is absolutely crucial. When you look around at the uh, playing field of some emerging CEOs that are coming up, um, there's a lot of them out there. Elon Musk seems to have his fingers in everything, and he appears to be kind of in the Jeff Bezos line. Who do you see out there of some interesting CEOs that are coming up? You say, you know, I think that is an emerging company that's got great leadership, and that impresses me. I'm, I'm sitting here smiling very quietly. I, I'm, I'm in very impressed with what Elon has done. SpaceX, I think, is truly spectacular. Obviously, what Jeff Bezos has done with, with Amazon is amazing, and I've been able to watch it from it being a little online bookseller to becoming what it is. I'm deeply impressed with Dennis Muhlenberg at Boeing now. I think he's a great leader. I think he, he understands the complexities of a very important business. You know, in the end, it really is about building a great team. The CEO may get a lot of credit. The credit they ought to get is for building the team because it's the team that actually does the job, not the CEO. What a great line. The credit a CEO should get is for building the team because the team is then going to execute everything that the company noun pulls off, exactly. achieves, yeah. or doesn't achieve. Right. Um, you know, always, always get the best people you can possibly get. Get people that are way smarter than you are. 
um, hire the best. It has been great to have you here. I, I toast you and your knowledge, everything you've done. Do you have a quick parting shot for today's entrepreneurs that we haven't covered yet? It's not about getting rich quick. It's about building something that will last. I love it. It's not about getting rich quick. It's about building something that will last. Well, I hope your knowledge lasts a long time. Thank you so much you for bet. being here. And thank you for watching. And we'll be back again in two weeks with another episode of A Beer in Business, finding entrepreneurial tips that you can use, whether you're running a t-shirt company in Berlin or you're running Boeing out of Seattle or Chicago or wherever great companies like that eventually find themselves. I'm Tom Ellsworth, The Biz Doc, and I hope we left you better than we found you.